Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right, everyone, you are listening to Your Money Momentum Podcast. My name is Tom Kennedy and Kevin Curley. Kevin, what's going on? Just out here celebrating Argentina's election. Got a Milton Friedman disciple taking over a country with 140% inflation. I am fascinated to see what happens. Yeah, maybe they can. Uh, he can take over our country too while they're at it. Um, but yeah, it'll be <laughs> it'll be interesting to see what's going. On. There's a lot of sh- there's a lot of political shift around the world taking place right now. So um, we'll see uh, we'll see what happens next year with ours. End of the year podcast or end of the year end of the month podcast. Uh, we're two days early, so a lot could happen in the next two days. So some of these stats and numbers might be off a little bit but let's uh let's get into it bringing you a look at the past month and what may come here's the latest financial update so finished off a pretty pretty good month you want to walk us through through some of the numbers yeah so tom uh since 1985 this is just outside of the top 10 best performances for the sp 500 in quite a long time, almost 40 years of data. Uh, If it was able to get a couple more percent uh, over the next two days, 48 hours or so, you know, to beat the top 10, you got to be up 8.8 or about eight and a half for the month. The best month ever was January 1987, which was up 13.2%. I would also (laughs) mention that I need one of the best months ever if I'm going to hit my 5,000 prediction, but uh, it's definitely trending the right way. S&P up 20% for year to date. That's a pretty big move. Well, the bull case for next year is the S&P 5000. So you would have the extreme bull case for for, for this year. <laughs> but it's not. I, I'm pretty close, though. Point. I mean, we're not. I mean, it might get there. And I laughed this week. All the uh, big wirehouses, all the major investment firms put out their projections for next year. And they're all a year behind me saying 5000 for end of 2024. But I, I don't know. I mean, this rally has got some legs. We get Santa Claus to deliver at the end of the year. We might be close to 5000 by the end of this year. And. I assume they'll all go back and revisit them. But their projections are silly because all they do every single year is 10% higher. That's the prediction. And that's why all those predictions from all those investment houses are the same, is they all look at it and go, ah, 10% higher, great. Well, you know, we, we came off by the one of the worst three months we strung together in a long time um, for returns in the market. So we were, I think we were oversold. We were due for a bounce. We had the seasonality behind us. And I'll tell you the, the correlation between the dollar and interest rates is back with the overall market. You have interest rates. You look at interest rates. Look at the ten-year treasury off of five percent was the high. You're under. You're right around four four right now. You have the dollar going down, and it's like clockwork. So you had a really, really good month. It looks like the the S and P is going to finish up close to ten percent, uh, maybe nine percent. Where are we at right now? You said eight and a half. Eight and a half as of today. You know, we got two slightly days. up, kind of flat for today, but we're on our way. NASDAQ, you have bonds performing. You have everything. You know, usually you have that inverse correlation with, with bonds and, and stocks, and you're, not, you're just you're, you're seeing as, as interest rates go down, again, bond prices are going up and, and stocks are going up. So you have a lot of the, a lot of the portfolios are moving in, in the same direction. So I think hopefully you'll have that continue into, into year end and into December. Yeah, I mean, this is just proof nobody has a crystal ball. If you look at the consensus from all the major investment firms last year, they predicted for 2023 that it was going to be the first negative year for equities. Like I said, almost every year, like clockwork, they predict a 10% increase. Last year, they all said it was negative, and here we are up 20%. So, you know, it pays to stay in the market and not listen to people who are very negative or even people who are very positive. You have the yeah. NASDAQ up 37% after its worst year for a long time. All those companies got killed in 2022 and expected more of the same and that just wasn't the case yeah i mean you got the average of the top 10 growth stocks in in the in the in the country right now up over 80 percent, which helps so you still have you know you still don't have a ton of breath but it's not but but 
stuff is performing. And uh, I think what you're going to see and what you always see in the month of December, you have a mutual fund managers, pension funds. You have these big investment managers that are just behind. No one, to your point, was calling for what happened in the market. So it's not even FOMO. It's, it's their bonuses. <laughs> it's their bonuses. You're going to see. You're going to see window dressing. And what that means is you're going to see mutual funds, pension funds, big investment dollars chase one category. It's going to be tech. It's going to be tech, I think, leads us into the rest of the year. And you're just going to see a tailwind, in my opinion, with these funds trying to lock in and try to get some last minute gains uh, for the year because a lot of them, whether they're hedge funds, pension funds, a lot of them are underperforming when you have a NASDAQ up 40, 47%. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be hard not to. Um, and I uh, would say the other part is it's not just tech though. The Dow Jones industrial average is 2% from all time highs. Uh, now it's not having that great of a year compared to some of the other indices, but it's up 8.84%. Uh, NASDAQ, like we said, up 37, S&P up 500, or sorry, S&P 500 up 20, but to only be up just under 9% and 2% away from all-time highs for the industrial average is really tremendous. And it just doesn't feel like a recession. Uh, I still think that we're headed towards one. I think that, that it will happen. It's clear we've had a higher rate of growth go to a much lower rate of growth. So there was you know, not negative growth because it didn't go negative, but like disinflation, we had disgrowth. <laughs> or lower levels of growth. So it, it might feel like it a little bit, but you know, the economy is starting to roll a little bit. Um, yeah, the other thing people are so fearful, $5.7 trillion in money market accounts between retail and institutional customers. Uh, that's a lot of money on the sidelines that I think might be chasing the best month ever. Yeah. You know, you're, you're absolutely right. That's, that's the highest we've seen in a long time. And that money is going to eventually have to uh, go somewhere. It's, it can't stay in money markets forever. I mean, it certainly can. But, you know, if, if you do see rates get cut next year as those go down, they look less and less attractive. So you could see some extension to this to this run. Um, but let's but let's talk about about this recession. You know, everyone's been calling for it this year. And there's a great. Uh, there's great research that comes out that we, that we subscribe to called the Sevens Report. They put something out every morning and they make the case for the four pillars. And they don't make a bear case or bull case. They just say the foundation of this recession has four pillars to it. It's uh, one, earnings, two, growth in the economy, three, inflation, and four, interest rates. Now, obviously, they're all tied and correlated to each other one way or the other. But those four are extremely important. All four of them have done... You've had this Goldilocks scenario where you've had growth been pretty decent this year in the, in the overall market. You're starting to see some cracks. You've had inflation going down, going in the right direction. We haven't really had any reversals or big spikes up. You've had the Fed. It's, you know, they've been pretty telegraphed. You knew they were going to continue to raise each time. They haven't had any major surprises at any meetings. They've had some hawkish forecasting and job owning, but they haven't had any major, hey, we've, Markets price again, 25 basis points, but they go 50 or, or, or even higher. And then uh, lastly, earnings. Earnings have been pretty, pretty resilient. Now, you know, if one of those cracks and goes the other way, because this market's been priced into to perfection, you could start to see, see some headwind. But it, in my opinion, I think it's going to be less and less. The story this year has been, been the inflation number. Every time, every month it comes out looking at that and what the Fed's going to do. I think it's fair to say that, or I'm predicting that inflation is probably going to continue to go down or, or flatline from here. And it's, it's, it's where we need it to be or close to it, right around 3%. Um, Fed moving rates, you know, the market's pricing in a 1% cut this time, this time next year. And for, you know, I, I don't know if you saw Chris Waller this morning, one of the Fed presidents, um, he's was the first one to come out and say, hey, if inflation continues to go lower, we could see some cuts. And you had the odds of a cut go from 32% to 68% in May, the first cut being in May at 68%. So I think those two are less going to be less important going forward. And I think it's going to be about growth, growth in the economy. Yeah, Just I want to <clears throat> I want to follow up on two things you said, which is one, the Goldilocks scenario. So I think Goldilocks for markets this year is, yeah, interest rates look like they may have peaked in the last couple of months. They're now declining. We had a two-month low on the 10-year Treasury, just below 4.4. That's really a nice tailwind from where we were. Uh, earnings have not fallen off. Growth has, hasn't been as strong, but it's still positive. So, And inflation is coming down. So I think 
you could see that Goldilocks scenario continue for sure. The other thing you mentioned, which I think can be confusing when you hear it on TV or you hear it on a podcast like this one, which is that stocks are priced to perfection. So do you want to jump in and just say what that means and why it's a concern and not a good thing? Yeah. So when I say when I say they're, they're priced at value is what I should say. Now, they can go over value. Um, but when you have earnings come in, you have PEs valuations around 19 and you have projected earnings next year of 245 a share, you're right around where we're at right now, maybe 2 percent higher. So a lot of the data, especially the the when it comes to the fixed income market and the Fed, it, it, it reacts quickly. And, so, and, and all this good data has been priced in. So the minute if inflation comes back out and it goes the other way, it could it could you could trigger a little sell off. Or if the Fed goes the other way and says, no, we're, we're hiking rates. Um, those two things are not priced in. And I think you'll get get a sell off in the market. So I don't know where you're going to see much more positive data unless you start to see earnings. Uh, projections for next year start to pick up um, and rates decline and growth does not fall off a cliff. I think that's going to be the biggest determinant for the next 12 months if we go get the soft landing or hard landing is growth in the economy. You know, the consumer balance sheets look in, you start to see delinquencies pick up. I know we continue to talk about that. It's nothing crazy. Um, does the corporate side start to get hit with earnings? I think that's just going to be the big, we don't know. You're starting to see a little bit of cracks here and there with some of the some of the data, but I think growth's going to be the new story. Does does this Let's talk about that growth story? So I, I would mention one last piece of data, which is just the VIX is hitting a multi-year low right now, down at a 12. So that's a pretty complacent market. Usually, that's a sign of uh, things are getting pretty good. Like Goldilocks continues to be uh, trying out all those different porches, but. To the growth conversation, I think that you're seeing across the world right now, we talked about it in a previous episode with Europe, with its fiscal deficits attacking them versus the U.S. not. This morning, the Wall Street Journal said that global sovereign debt interest payments are expected to top $2 trillion. Now, I'm personally not a Keynesian guy, but most of the acad academics and economics people in the government are, and they think that government spending is a major factor in the economy and it, you know, it can kind of drive or whatever. So if you have $2 trillion in interest payments and you continue to borrow, it keeps going higher. At some point you have to cut government spending or raise taxes to meet that problem. That should be based on a Keynesian model, a major decline in growth. Yeah, that's such a good point. And we talk about just the interest payment that the U.S. had alone last month was seventy-eight uh, billion. As big as the defense budget. Seventy-eight billion. That's, interest. That's so. <laughs> well, let's put that in perspective. That's nine hundred billion annualized, just in interest payments. Do you know what TARP was in two thousand eight to bail out the banks? It was seven hundred billion, is what they proposed, and they thought Correct. they were absolutely crazy. That's pre-inflation, Tom. That's pre-inflation. These numbers don't make sense. But just to put it in perspective, it's like just the interest alone will, will bankrupt us. And I think to your point, I think I don't, the big question is: someone said it the other day. They phrased it really well: is are they going to cut rates because they have to cut rates, or because? They just can cut rates. Two big, big differences. If they have to cut rates, that means the economy is cracking. We're going into recession. And the only tool they have in the bag um, is to lower interest rates. And they're pretty high right now. And I think you'll see them drop pretty quickly. If they don't have to, but they think that they should, um, that, that's, the, that's the the soft landing scenario, which we've never had before, by the way. So, um, But I think we have a massive, massive sovereign debt crisis and by the way just two and a half years ago you had i think it was at the peak 17 trillion dollars in sovereign debt with negative yields and that's completely flip-flopped and now to your point two trillion dollars in interest rate payments just to just to service that debt yeah look it's a controversial figure but it wasn't a controversial policy when trump suggested the u.s should issue 100 year notes or bonds, I guess. I don't even know if you call them bonds at that point. <clears throat> You'd have to call them super bonds or something else ridiculous. But he said, look, interest rates are zero. We should issue 100 year notes and refinance all our debt. That looks like a pretty good idea right now. And it's something people can take to their personal lives too, which is right now is not a great time to borrow money. But if the Fed does drop rates, let's say it's two and a half percent over the next 12 months, it's a chance for you to look at all your own debts and say, how do I consolidate these? How do I reduce these to pay a lot less interest so you don't end up like the US government, which is at some point going to run out of money. Um, you just can't spend like this indefinitely and cut taxes. So 
Yeah, you'd have to have massive austerity, and it's just it, and the challenge. I know we've talked about this before. It's whether you're on the left or the right, it's political suicide. No one wants to do either of those, and it's really probably the only, at the end of the day, the only real way to tackle this debt. But I think they are going to be forced, forced to to cut rates for that reason alone. It's just, it's just, it's snowballing. It's absolutely snowballing. Yeah. Well, this morning we got more data on the housing. Uh, another positive month for housing. Uh, up again. And now this data is from September, so it's a little bit old, but seven months in a row where the prices are going higher. So, Tom, tell me why I don't just own all real estate. It, all it does is go up. <laughs> it's true. It, it does. Um, except 2008. Uh, maybe two, maybe owns two, a commercial two, building right now, what their, what their prices are doing. No, it's uh, one. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a huge advocate of real estate. There's different ways to own it, like we've talked about. Everyone's in a different in different uh, investment profile situation, et cetera. But, uh, you know, housing, it's, you're right. It continues to go up, which is just crazy based on where rates are at, but it comes down to supply and demand and there's no supply out there because no one's trading in their mortgage and builders aren't building because it costs too much to carry the, the cost to build with interest rates so high. So you're in this weird, like, you know, limbo where you, you don't have the supply being put out there the demand is kind of staying stagnant it could even be, be the demand could be possibly be even falling it's just that there's so little supply that it's keeping prices elevated so now you mentioned commercial those are two different animals retail and and, and commercial but they're but they're all doing well i mean COVID is is over um you know i don't know if the you're, you're starting to hear more companies do the go back to the office and not do the hotel model as much and maybe forcing employees. So maybe office rebounds a little bit more than, than we thought, which will help commercial real estate. But, uh, you know, it, it's tough on the real estate side. I don't know. I don't know what to think of it because the numbers don't lie. And you're right. They continue just to go up every month. Yeah, I, uh, I think the only place that's been hurting uh, really this year is probably the oil market and commodities generally, which was a hot spot to be for a little while, but down 5.8% year to date for the Bloomberg Commodity Index. Uh, gold doing fine outside of that, uh, but you've seen utilities fall off as a sector. Energy is basically flat. Um, you know, it kind of seems like the end of the cycle to me. Well, it's <laughs> just those things start to roll over. That's kind of it, right? Yeah, or you know, it's just the calm before before the storm. I, I think, you know, I don't know what's going to come out of left field. I don't know, you know, what skeletons are still out there. You know, we had the banking crisis in March that looked pretty scary, but with interest rates going to five last month, you think that some would reappear, and and we didn't see it. Um, I don't I don't know what the next crisis is that that that's going to happen, but I think it just I'll keep your eye on the growth number in the economy, because having rates this high, this quickly to lag, it, it, it lags. It's going to take time to truly have an effect. And it might not be as much as, of an effect that we thought. Maybe we could stomach these these higher rates. Uh, maybe they are just so low that, you know, maybe this is maybe this is the normal. I don't think it is. But um, I think of any type of crack in the in in growth, GDP um, could really start to have a, an effect. All right, Tom. Well, that's all I've got. Uh, should we move on to some bold predictions? Let's do it. Get your future freezing cold takes as we launch into our latest series of bold predictions. So why don't we why don't we do this? Well, we got December. What what is what's the market going to do in December? We're going higher. I think uh, I'm going to stick with my five thousand dollar five thousand dollar five thousand target on the S and P five hundred. Uh, look, it's trending that way. Like I said, volatility's down. Interest rates continue to decline. Uh, we got some companies reporting earnings right now, but it's kind of the end of the earnings cycle. So everybody's going to be gearing up for next year. And you just heard all the investment houses say, "Hey, get ready for ten percent gains next year." If, if you think that, you want to get ahead of it. So I think we'll get a nice rally, especially Sam is going to come to, what is it, Broad and Wall? So that's a 10% move from roughly from where we're at right now, which, you know, it's happened before. Kind of cracked the best month ever. 
Um, so we'll see. Maybe it'll happen the first week of January, but I think it's positive. I think it's turning in the right direction. Uh, my bold prediction for the next 12 months is that the Fed is going to do what it always does, which is overshoot. It's going to take the stairs on the way up like they've done hiking. Now, they took some pretty steep stairs in this cycle, but they're going to take the elevator shaft down. Uh, I think they cut two and a half points between now and next December. Yeah, you know, you stole my bull prediction. I I want to disagree. With you. So I want to. I want to disagree. Glad I jumped so in there. Bad. Hey, go go stronger. Say they're going to cut a hundred or uh, five hundred all the way back down to zero. Listen, they like I said. I, I'll I'll continue to say this every podcast. <laughs> December twenty twenty one. They predicted at the end of twenty twenty two that we were going to be at 085 percent on the Fed funds rate, and we were at four. Um, so they got it. They got it real wrong on the way up. They're definitely going to get it wrong on the way down. And typically, what you've seen in the past is when they cut rates, it goes really quick. But that's because they always have to. There's something wrong with the economy, and they have to drop it. So if you if you go through this scenario that's never happened before, we've had the soft where we've had the soft landing, and they're just going to cut rates because they can. Could be a different story. But if they have to cut rates because they have to, I mean, you could see. Two, two point five, three percent come off real quick. Uh, but yeah, the market, I think you see the data too in that way. Yeah, I mean, you, you got the market pricing in uh, this time next year a full one percent lower. And like I said, you just had Chris Waller speak this morning. First kind of Fed official to come out and say, "Hey, if the inflation's lower, I don't see why we need to keep rates this high." And you literally saw the odds in May of a rate cut go from thirty-two to sixty-eight percent, which was a pretty pretty big jumps. So either they see something that we don't, or maybe they're just in this, maybe, maybe they maybe they just have this scenario where they have the luxury to say, Hey, maybe we should just cut rates, but hasn't happened before. We'll see if it happens this time around. Yeah. The last bold prediction I'd have is that the recession that we keep expecting to happen might get delayed. Um, and that would also go along with the fed cuts or maybe it won't, maybe they'll cut to prevent it. But, I think that there's a lot of people up for election in 2024 and none of them want to lose their jobs. And I think that they might do something from a government standpoint to try to delay the election until, or sorry, delay the recession until the day after the election. Um, we saw this first done by Richard Nixon. He wanted a landslide and <laughs> minutes, hours, days later, the economy just started to collapse. And it was a real simple thing. He did everything he could to press every level possible to make sure he got reelected because he knew if it was in a recession, on, we'll call it November 1st, he's done. But if he could last until mid-November, he could get reelected and he had four years to figure it out. Yeah, I I wouldn't disagree with you on that, um, which sets up for a really, really scary 2025. But hey, that, that's so far away. Um, let's just let's just take the good as it comes. All right. All right. Well, thanks, Tom. That's, that's a wrap. We'll uh, catch back up at our mid-month. Thanks, Kevin. You've been listening to your Money Momentum brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.